As I mentioned, in, as we mentioned in the first panel, uh, in conjunction with with several other state policy organizations, we developed the agenda for state action that hopefully all of you have a copy of now. Uh, hopefully, in your dreams tonight, you're going to hear agenda for state action. Having heard it so many times, um, we've got a toolkit here. Uh, that hopefully will be a good foundation for working together in the future. Nick Dranius of the Goldwater Institute, who's going to be talking with us uh, here in a minute, has developed, has helped develop for the Goldwater Institute uh, a, a, a broader set toolkit. Uh, it's really an extraordinary piece of work that, uh, that I'll let him talk about and highlight some aspects of. Uh, but the important thing is that working together uh, as states, there's a lot that we can accomplish that we haven't been able to do singly. So. I just want to say a word about each of our panelists. I'm going to ask Nick to speak first on, on uh, the, the toolkit from out of Goldwater in Arizona. Nick, as you know, try to give him, if you can be a little supportive, Nick is a very shy person, a very, a very, a very a confrontation averse and, and litigation averse person. So uh, we're going to uh, just try to uplift him a little bit. Um, He's, uh, he's, he's really a, a force to be uh, reckoned with. The next time that I get into a confrontation with him of any sort, I, I'm going to be armed with tactical battlefield nuclear weapons. Uh, yeah. Thank you. We've got, uh, following him, Phil Kirpin of Americans for Prosperity, who's going to talk about the uh, assault on the environmental uh, front. The, you know, healthcare has gotten a lot of attention, but uh, what the EPA has, by the way, and, and uh, Kathleen White, who I have the honor of working with at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and I have uh, an article on the current issue of Inside Alec about all the ways that the EPA is assaulting um, our, you know, the economies of our states uh, in the guise of just across the board, Department of Interior and EPA. And it's sort of like an avalanche. It's not as, it's not as high profile a thing as the, as the Obamacare, uh, but it's a much more pernicious <clears throat> much more pernicious and pervasive uh, and dangerous thing and, and uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot that we have to do at the state level to fight it off. Uh, then uh, Mary Catherine Stout is uh, Governor Rick Perry's uh, budget and policy director. Um, well, we were glad to be able to convince her to come over and talk to us about you know, this, the fiscal situation facing Texas and uh, how federal funds with mandates attached uh, has contributed to that situation and what we can do now to get out of this increasingly tight straitjacket uh, facing the, bu the, the, the Texas budget and facing all of your budgets, I'm sure. Uh, and then finally, uh, Professor Randy Barnett of Georgetown University Law School uh, is one of, our, one of our leading lights in, in, uh, among jurists and law professors in terms of constitutional originalism. Um, he's made many contributions uh, over the years to our understanding of what the Constitution originally meant and to uh, where we can head now uh, to get back to something like uh, an original understanding of our Constitution. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Nick. And because of the time that we have and, and uh, the fact that we have four panelists instead of th three, I'm going to have to be a little bit ornery, as we say in Texas, uh, about the 10-minute rule. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, Mario has been an amazing organizer. He's been tasked with, I think, about a thousand different things to do, and he's accomplished all of them. And one of the greatest things that Mario has achieved is bringing together a consensus among state policy think tanks in the agenda for state action, uh, which includes many of the ideas that, that both he and I have developed, as well as other uh, think tanks around the country. And I just want to begin with the point that I think Dr. Moffitt made at the last panel. There is no silver bullet if you want to defend state sovereignty. You have to have a strategy. And the federalism toolkit that the, that the Goldwater Institute has devised is to provide you with the essential tactical tools that anyone who's serious about state sovereignty needs to deploy or at least consider deploying. Among those, of course, are the interstate compact ideas, the Article 5 uh, state-initiated amendments convention ideas, but also a number of other ideas that I think everyone in this room would agree upon. Uh, so I wanted to emphasize that. This is about where you can focus resources across a spectrum of ideas to resist 
federal tyranny and the usurpation of state sovereignty. And I want to emphasize also that there's a fundamental choice you have to make in your mind. And that is whether you are interested in civil disobedience or effective legal strategy. There's a fundamental difference between the two approaches. I am willing to be perfectly respectful of anyone who makes the political calculus that civil disobedience is the way to go to change our culture. But if that's what you're going to do, be very clear that that's what you're going to do. Because if you present what is in effect only civil disobedience as a legal strategy that, you, that is effective when it is not, the tendency of that will be to make it harder to win on effective legal strategies that really have a chance of prevailing in our legal system. Again, I'm not going to judge you if you want to do civil disobedience. I think that there is a range of reasonable dis disagreement that could exist on that. But my presentation today in the toolkit is geared towards effective legal strategy. At the Goldwater Institute, we succeed. We advance ideas and we achieve our goals. I work with Clint Bullock, who I regard as the Michael Jordan of constitutional litigation. He's been to the Supreme Court three times, one, two out of three times. I'm fortunate enough to be going to the Supreme Court for the first time uh, in, in this April, or the coming April. We do not come up with pipe dreams. We come up with ideas that will have good chances of success in court and anywhere else you need to go. And I just want to highlight a few of these ideas, and I'll cover additional ideas at 3 o'clock or so uh, at the ALEC uh, Federalism Workshop that will be conducted later today. As you see, there are 10 ideas in this tactical toolkit. What I wanted to emphasize first is the idea of taxpayer courts. How many here would have liked to see taxpayers get a crack at challenging the GM bailout? All right. Well, the truth is, you can't go to federal court for that, not under existing case law. Since 1923, the Supreme Court has said that taxpayers have no standing to challenge spending programs. None at all. They've made exceptions when it comes to the Establishment Clause. You can debate why they suddenly found that exception. Uh, but if you're a taxpayer and you believe your money is being used unconstitutionally, taken from you without due process of law as in the form of a tax for unconstitutional purposes, you cannot bring that claim in federal court. However, our research shows that states in their courts have general power to hear just those claims. And here's the kicker. To the very extent that federal courts continue to not hear taxpayer claims, you will protect your case if it's filed in state court only as a taxpayer from ever being removed to the lower echelons of the federal court system. Meaning the only place in the federal court system that you could ultimately be drawn into would be the Supreme Court and its appellate function. And that's a pretty, pretty good odd, odds right now if you're coming from Arizona where you have to face the Ninth Circuit before you can get to the Supreme Court. And I suspect, I suspect that there's some folks in here that, that, uh, that might have a similar circuit challenge. So, one of the things we recommend is that states clearly indicate in a statute that they're welcome to accept taxpayer standing based challenges to unconstitutional actions under the federal constitution by both state and federal officials, including opening their arms to challenges to things like bailouts, subsidies, TARP, at least within their jurisdiction, using what remedies are available in state court to block those actions. Now, I'm not promising you these cases are going to win, all right? I am promising you that you're going to have a better hearing in state court, all other things being equal, than in federal court when you challenge federal power. So that's one of the key ideas that we've developed in the toolkit. You need to have the best place to advance very difficult arguments. The best place is not going to be in the federal court system, all other things being equal, when you're challenging federal power. The next thing I want to emphasize is the idea of interdicting grants. As you and many state legislators certainly are aware, when the federal government gives money to the states, it doesn't come free. It comes conditionally most of the time. We all are hoping for the elusive block, block grant of Medicaid, but it's not happened yet and you know it may never happen. But that doesn't mean that you have to live with conditional grants. 